So um, let's talk about amyloid because it's an acquired ventricular uh, issue, but it's also the archetypal uh, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction illness. So um, let's have a talk about this illness. So amyloid is not an illness. It's a bunch of illnesses which just happen to look the same. And fundamentally, it's two illnesses, and we'll come to it. But whatever the illness is, what's going on is in your circulation, you have some, you have some abnormal protein which no matter where it comes from, does this thing. And that is it gelatinizes, it sets, and it sets in the mesh of the tissues, in amongst the mesh of the tissues in these so-called B-depleted sheets. That's a sort of an a electron microscope a turn of phrase. But fundamentally, it makes, it gelatinizes. And within the tissues, uh, it's like as if you've dipped a sponge into honey. It's within the, cat, it's within the interstitium. It's not something you can wring out or cut out. Uh, it's, it's deeply enmeshed. And fundamentally, this stuff comes from two places. There are two illnesses. One is the TTR illness, or transthyretin. Transthyretin is a protein that all of us make in our liver. It used to be called prealbumin, and it is a carrier protein for thyroxin and so on. But fun it's, it's a normal protein, which in some people mutates slightly, and that's an illness, sorry, of old men. The other illness is the AL amyloid. This is a protein which is made by bone marrow. This condition is a bone marrow malignancy in the, in, like a leukemia type illness. They're completely different. And the abnormal protein is an immunoglobulin, IgG, as opposed to transthyretin, which is a protein that comes from the liver. But the net effect is both of these two completely different proteins have the same phenomenon, and that, that is they're able to gelatinize or be deplete. And then, unfortunately, that they can both send their protein in a subset of people to the heart. They can send it to other places too, and there are famous uh, clinical signs and these sort of Google pictures of the raccoon eyes where the amyloid protein is in the periorbital tissue, and the famous one where the AL amyloid gets into the tongue becomes very big and the tongue is so big that it can't quite fit in the mouth and they have these teeth indentations in their tongue because the tongue is so thick. And in fact, several of the ones I've looked after, this is how the diagnosis, uh, the penny dropped. All this sort of glassy uh, kind of uh, bruised look around the eyes. But it can go into nerve tissue, it can go into the skin, it goes into the colon, it, go, it, it can get in anywhere basically this tissue. But of course, what we care about is uh, in, our, in our clinics is cardiac infiltration. And the classical finding is of these waxy, shiny, greasy hearts on, on cross-section like this, very, very thick, but for all the thickness, almost no volts, because this is not more muscle. It's more thickness, sure, but it's got this gelatinous, waxy stuff in between the cells, so it doesn't make for more volts. The classic findings on uh, ECHO are of this speckled, thick, but quite well contracting looking heart, thick RLV, and importantly, thick RV. In general, you can't even see the RV free wall it sort of merges with the rest of the, the, rest of the uh, thorax. And if you can see an RV wall, particularly if there's a slither of pericardial fluid to outline it, it's amyloid to approved otherwise. They often have big pleural effusions, but only a tiny amount of pericardial fluid. They'll sometimes have thickening of the atrium and thickening of the valves. This slither of pericardial fluid should absolutely alert you. So a thick and some a pretty well contracting heart with, a, with an RV wall that you can see and a slither of pericardial fluid, again, as I said, is amyloid to approved otherwise. The other thing that you should think about when you see a good contracting vigorous heart like this with great big atriums is you should think about amyloid. And in fact, uh, there was a turn of phrase sort of called the Mickey Mouse ears appearance. It doesn't get used that much, but in the 90s, we used to refer to that. Very large atria, out of proportion to what they should be, and they're big because the, the filling pressures, LVEDP and RVEDP, have been very high for a long time. And Ben Fitzgerald, some years ago, who's in our practice uh, when he was in the Cleveland Clinic, diff pointed out that if you see that these uh, atrium are out of proportion, you should think about um, amyloid. Now, these ventricles contract very well, but they won't. They don't. Well, they look like they contract very well. But they don't, they don't relax well. They, these are the, the stiff ventricles that, that make for high filling pressures. So their E is very high, their E prime is very low, their E to E prime, which is a marker of left atrial filling pressure, is very, very high, the highest, in fact. 
in the 30s or the 40s or, or more because their E primes are sometimes down around two. And their D cell times are very short. So they're basically, going back to my analogy with the train station, there are so many people on the train station, the filling pressure is so high that when the mitral valve opens, when the doors open, they rush in with enormous filling pressure. But it finishes up very quick because this ventricle is thick, it's stiff, and going back to my analogy, the carriage is full within, within milliseconds. So the people who get through, the, there's a lot of back pressure, the doors open, they rush in, but there's no room in there because it's a stiff, thick, restri restrictive uh, chamber. Remember the strain, that's the normal bullseye from before. These people have this classical pattern. They have reduced systolic strain. Interestingly, their ejection fraction is normal. So here's a situation, David, where they do have reduced GLS. GLS on this person is, what, 8 or something, versus 20. But classically have this so-called apical sparing, the pink kind of appearance with, with, the, with the red in the centre. And uh, Tom Marwick's group and, and, and Jim Thomas and Cleveland Clinic uh, five or six years ago uh, went, uh, identified this and found that in a whole bunch of amyloid patients, they had they all seem to have this apical sparing pattern compared to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and the aortic stenosis patients, which uh, have a more global kind of appearance. Interestingly, uh, Rodney Falk, who's the world expert, who's from Boston, uh, uh, described this um, uh, uh, sort of descriptively rather than numerically a couple of years before that. And interestingly, in this uh, poster, which we took a photo of, uh, I think this was at ACC last year, uh, it seems to be that the reason that there's apical strain is it actually is more amyloid in the base of the heart. Now, MRI has a role to play the so-called T1 mapping, which I'm sure we're going to hear about in the MRI talks in a minute, measure water. And it turns out that the more extracellular protein there is, the more extracellular water there is. And so that now we can find, we look at this so-called T1 map and look for extracellular water volume. Normal people are in the 20s here, this is 47 47%, I'm not exactly sure of the, of the quantitation, but normal ejection fraction, low strain, high BNP, that means high filling pressure, and lots of extracellular water. And so MRI now has a role. Now let's just go back to TTR amyloid for a minute because everything I've told you so far is all amyloids. Let's just talk about one amyloid for a minute, the TTR, the old man's amyloid. By accident, TTR amyloid, it, the protein, these people's hearts accidentally take up bone scan tracer. So if you do a bone scan for fracture or cancer or disseminated cancer or something, and the heart lights up like this, and on, on slicing it, you get this hot uh, bone scan tracer, which got nothing to do with the heart, accidentally, that's almost 100% specific for TTR amyloid. And so when you get your amyloid patient clinically now, first test you do after you get the echo, which shows it, is a bone scan. Because if it's a bone scan positive, it is TTR amyloid, old person's amyloid, marrow, marrow uh, sorry, um, liver-based, and apart from ma ma managing the heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, there's nothing else to do, and this has a relatively slow uh, course. It's indolent and it doesn't sort of gallop away. If it's bone scan negative, then it's highly likely that it's the AL group of amyloid. And within that, there are three sort of spectrums within the illness, but fundamentally, this is a multiple myeloma type illness. Now, whether you, the spectrum between whether something's fully malignant and there's multiple myeloma, or whether it's just amyloid, or this other thing called MGUS, is really not that important. What's important is that this is a clone abnormality. One cell has gone mutant, gone crazy, one has become two, become four, become eight, become a billion, and that clone makes that protein which in that person gelatinizes. Now, back in the old days, uh, when I was doing this as a fellow in the Cleveland Clinic, uh, what the only value of echo was just to tell you how quickly you were going to die. And the worse the diastology, the shorter the prognosis. And indeed, back in the old days, five months. So that means when, if by the time you got to us to, at the Cleveland Clinic, uh, to the doctors, uh, basically we would predict for you, you know, how, how quickly you had to get all your affairs in order uh, for the end of your life. It was awful. And there was a thought that chemotherapy might help because remember the stuff's being made in the marrow. But Roger, Rodney Falk, who I just talked to you about before, who came to Brisbane last year, had the penny drop uh, uh, brainwave that maybe bone marrow transplant was the solution. Because if the marrow is making the stuff, then fix the marrow. And we seem to have been able to c achieve this with myeloma and now with, with, bone, with amyloid. So what do you do when you do this? Well, basically what you do is you are going to get rid of the old marrow, which is making the bad stuff, 
and give them a new marrow which you're going to put in for them. And so what you do is you uh, take the person and you encourage, you give them a bit of chemo to get rid of some of the bad cells, but basically you use this sort of dialysis machine to get a bunch of stem cells off them. You do this over a month or three, and you end up with a couple of bags that look like this in the fridge of their own stem cells. Then you give them a fatal dose of chemotherapy so that you completely abolish their whole marrow. About the same time, usually actually the day before, sorry, the day after, you give them a stem cell, uh, a stem cell donation from themselves. And just like a lawn where you put weed killer out and kill the whole lawn, plant some new seeds, we plant a whole new marrow. And this new marrow, which I might say requires you to have all your vaccines again because you've forgotten how to have, be immune to everything that you're vaccinated against a child, it's also forgotten how to make amyloid. And so this new marrow is producing no amyloid. And then you say, well, how does that help? Because all this amyloid is still all in the tissues. Well, as it turns out, the, t the amyloids in the tissues is actually being turned over all the time. So when you're an amyloid person, you've got a thick heart like this. If you could actually radio label one of the amyloid proteins that you've got today, in a year's time, it will not be the same protein. It will have been turned over. So by stopping the factory that's making the stuff and the natural turnover, which would normally be degrading it in the tissues, we've been able to show that in, say, in this person, for example, this sick old heart, which is the one you saw at the beginning, has become basically a normal looking heart with a global longitudinal strain going from eight to say 19 and virtually complete now resolution of the, um, of the strain pattern. And in fact, uh, Ben Fitzgerald published this case in that case journal about a year ago and was the talk of the town because nobody had ever seen complete normalization of this uh, bone marrow, uh, sorry, of this um, strain pattern with bone marrow transplant before. Finished? So lastly, uh, this is a lady who's now 20 years on uh, and uh, a long-term survivor. So we've learned from the process that um, we can predict outcome based on this. If you, get, um, uh, if you can't get a bone marrow transplant, then obviously you, we, you still have the short, short um, uh, prognosis. If you get hematologic re uh, uh, remission, but you don't get uh, the cardiac remission, you have a slightly better prognosis. But the best people, the people who do the best, and some of them are out to 10 years now, are the ones who get both cardiac and marrow remission. So to summarize, amyloid is a group of diseases which can infiltrate the heart, but there's two types. TTR is an old men's illness, liver-based, slowly progressive, and no specific treatments, but a slow illness. The AL version is a terrible illness, rapidly progressing, often in young people, and it's a marrow illness, poor prognosis, but stem cell transplant now offers some hope. Thank you very much.